Hey guys, it's Harrison alongside Josh. Welcome to the Awkward Sports Podcast. We're halfway through the college football season. It's certainly been an interesting one, and it just leads to that usual debate we have every year. And you know, it and the thing, it wasn't really even a contest, I feel like, until this weekend. If you had asked me before this weekend who's winning the Heisman, I would have said, well, given that USC is still winning and he's leading the league in touchdowns, like Caleb Williams seemed like an obvious pick to win his second uh, Heisman, which, you know, is hard to just say guaranteed because it's only happened once where a player has won two Heismans. But it looked like he was very much on pace to do that. But it's no longer the case. Uh, he threw three interceptions. And now suddenly it's wide open. So, I mean, obviously, I feel like you look at this past week and USC lost and they haven't looked particularly particularly great uh, in the past no. few weeks. Just squeezing out wins by a couple of points until now they got obliterated this week. I still think it's his to lose. I don't think I it's agree. as wide open as people think. I think that he is still the clear front runner. And the reason why I say this is because we look at the other potential candidates that could be in the running for it. A Michael yeah, Penix from Washington. Yeah, I think Penix Jr. is the front runner hands down now. Not right. I, I still think Caleb Williams, regardless, will be a finalist for the Heisman. He will be at the ceremony, was it end of December, early January? Yeah. Down the road there, yes. And that's where that's where I'm gonna like disagree. I think that I still think Caleb Williams is the front runner for the Heisman trophy. Um, I do think of and the reason why is I think that other candidates such as Michael Panix or Bo Nix, um, these guys uh that are kind of been in talks of being in that group with him for the Heisman. The reason I say that Caleb Williams ultimately is still the front runner is a, his stats are still spectacular, which obviously we right. would think would be the we would think would be the driving front runner for the Heisman Trophy. While stats are important, I think as far as winning in college football, I don't think that as is as important to the Heisman today as it might have been in the past. I think what the Heisman Trophy, the people that vote for it nowadays are trying to do. If you look at the history, and we're talking about just quarterbacks here, obviously there have been other position players in the past that have won it. Right. But if we talk like, about throughout the history of quarterbacks. just won it three years ago? Right. Like, and, if we, and if we talk about like the history of quarterbacks in the past that have won the Heisman Trophy, like we're going back to like, let's just say, I don't know, we went through the 80s, 90s, to the early 2000s. Most of those guys didn't pan out in the NFL. And I think that the Heisman Trophy, as we've gotten further and further down the road and has become more and more quarterback centric, they're also trying to kind of put themselves in a better light where their legends that are Heisman Trophy winners go on to succeed. So I think where your potential draft pick lies really puts an like I think that matters more now to the voters than winning in college football I truly do if you look at some of the recent Heisman winners not many of them a quarterback were national championship champions Kyler Murray Baker Mayfield a lot of these guys were number one picks now Joe Burrow won a natty and they happen to have the greatest season of all time yeah but so, Joe Burrow is also a number one pick Trevor Lawrence exactly. is a number one overall pick yeah, yeah and that might be the but one also that did quarterbacks who were winning yeah exactly and, and lawrence was and lawrence actually I don't, he, I don't believe ever i don't believe he ever won the heisman trophy he was like the one like lone number one pick in like the past few years that didn't get it i didn't win a heisman trophy if i remember correctly but if you look at a lot of the recent top picks they've been heisman winners because they're trying to I feel like rebrand the the trophy, rebrand like who they want winning it. I don't think winning in college football matters as much. And if you look at the mock drafts, you don't see Dylan Gabriel, Bo Nix, Michael Panix, or even JJ McCarthy rather as even like top ten picks. Some of like I don't see any of these guys in the first round. Uh, and I think I've because seen some of Michael that, Penix at like you know the 29th or 30th overall pick, right? And even then, like just because they're not necessarily first round picks right now, like some of these guys might go and they beat can. their opponents and they'll shoot up their draft stock all the way to the top 10. Maybe, yeah. 
And I think, and I think if they do that, I think maybe that there'll be more, if it'll be in the discussion more now players like Drake may, who are supposed to be a higher pick. Now his stats haven't been like to what some of these other guys have been like a Jordan Travis. He could still very well make it still winning. It's like if guys like Jordan Travis, for some reason, have a Heisman case with, similar numbers to Graham Mertz. Now I don't know why Drake May doesn't have a case either. Uh, for the exactly. article I wrote for the blog, I didn't list either of those guys, but, you know. And I think, say and you are. mentioned them too, though. And I think one of the things is, yeah, May, yeah. May has a case because of his draft pick. And I think that where your projected draft pick is means more nowadays in the Heisman, in the Heisman voting than winning college football games. Obviously, stats still matter. So I feel like, I mean, you can go back to when Tebow won it, the first sophomore ever to win a Heisman. Yeah, Tebow had a ridiculous season. He's ridiculous one of those guys season. where he went nine and three. Yeah, like 30 plus touchdowns, over 20 rushing touchdowns. Yeah. It didn't matter if they yeah, were. Yeah, if you have a ridiculous year, absolutely. But to this, to that point, if you look at the, the the players this year, the people that we argue should be over Caleb Williams or some of these other guys that are protected high picks like a Drake May, none of these guys have in absurd stats. And I think that's kind of what you're going to have to have if you're not a projected top pick. And if you don't, it's going to be harder for those guys to win it. Now, here's what's working against a Caleb Williams, right? We've only seen one Heisman Trophy winner win two Heisman Trophies, and that's Archie Griffin if you go all the way back to like, I think it was the seventies or eighties. Yeah, even like if you want to do Tebow as well, besides Archie Griffin, he technically had m the most first place votes in 2008, but he Sam Bradford won because you know, the points total, the points, he, like when Rick Porcello beat JV is the Cy Young. And guess what? Sam Bradford was also a number one pick in the draft. So but if you, either of those guys worked out. And it didn't. And that's and it was one of those things where not everyone's still going to work out. But you can see, like, as years have gone by, they start looking at those potential candidates. Like, the year Kyle Trask had a few years back from Florida, you know, people I've, at some points were trying to make the kind of case for him to maybe be in the, in the running for a Heisman Trophy. And guys like Matt Jones, who had, you know, very similar stats outside of completion percentage, Matt Jones kind of blew Trask out of the water in completion percentage. But other than that, the other numbers were very close. I think you look at some of these other guys that had a better shot, they were higher potential draft picks. And um, I think that that at the end of the day, and I know I'm kind of beating a dead horse with this. Yeah, but I think that on about it, but here's the thing too, that I've also been waiting to say is that you keep talking about, well, they're going to be number one overall pick. They're going to be number one overall pick. Uh, one, if that's all that matters, Miles Garrett should have been a Heisman winner, number one overall pick in 2017. You, you know, I mean, he, ha he has had an NFL career, but he's not exactly, you know, Patrick Mahomes, who pr was never even going to ever win the Heisman. I think just the reality, too, is that, and I get the argument of them trying to make it where, these guys go on and continue to be great, but you also really can't predict it that well. Like think about Baker Heisman first overall. Cool. You succeed in that. But then we've been talking about how not good Baker is. We had to have a debate on this podcast about it. Kyler Murray. I mean, yes, he's had a career, but is he's not going to be a hall of famer on this current trajectory. Let's see Joe Burrow. Got to the Super Bowl, has won his contract. Suddenly, if he keeps playing like he has so far this year, suddenly we might be talking about him in the same conversation. And that's despite the fact that he won a national championship and had a monster year. He threw 60 touchdowns. Yeah, and again, I think branching off that, like I said, I think that's I think the draft picks the number one thing, but I also think stats also matter. So like you have right. to have the numbers. Like the reason why we're not talking about Drake May as a clear front runner is because the numbers aren't there, not because his projected pick isn't high. Right. Uh, and, and, at, he, and honestly, I don't even know why he's not getting enough credit. UNC is having their best start in 25 years, and a lot of it is because of him. Yeah, and it's and it's also, and I think the reason why he's not is because of like the other players that you mentioned in the article that you wrote about the numbers that they had and that Drake May's numbers aren't there. So like I said, I do think the draft pick matters, right. but I also think the, the stats matter as well. 
What I don't think matters as much is winning. And I think that because Caleb Williams I think lost- it kind of does, though, because that's why guys like Dylan Gabriel and J.J. McCarthy are in the discussions at all. Because, look, McCarthy, I think, is going to be a finalist by the end of the year still. And you could also argue he's being carried by an absolutely elite Michigan defense who has only given up 10 points once. But he's also done some great things and. I made the case for him where even though he doesn't have the counting stats, he still has one of the best completion percentages, if that even matters. Because look, Graham Mertz is almost at 80% too. You no, could also... That does fall under it, though. Until oh, and yards per attempt, which is one of the best in college football. Right. No, and I think that falls under it too, though. Like like you just mentioned, McCarthy's completion percentage. Like That's not like a number, but it is a stat. Like That still I... falls into that. I think that maybe they're kind of fringe i think guys like dylan gabriel jj mccarthy are more on the outside in my opinion are more on the outside looking in to guys like um caleb williams and drake may and and, and michael panix and those guys um but they might i think you know obviously there's four finalists so somebody's gonna get that slot i think maybe jordan travis also, obviously with his numbers as well but he's also been winning i just think that he, at the end of the day is definitely someone that i will say is being carried by the fact that florida state is winning yeah, and I think that it's um I think that one of those things though at the end of the day, when we get right down to it at the end, unless um you see some one of these quarterbacks like a McCarthy or Travis or any of these guys that are on a winning team that have a perfect record, uh put up ridiculous stats, I don't think that they're going to win the Heisman uh trophy. I think that again, I think that winning for the voters in the right. Heisman Trophy isn't as highly touted as some people do, which uh, which is why I think Caleb Williams is still the front runner despite the loss. Because the one, lo- I mean, the loss that they had was bad, but it was against Notre Dame and it wasn't in conference. And the fact that they still have, yeah, all they are four and zero in the Pac twelve, right? Let's, and if, and they have all of their games first place, them. right? And they have like a lot of their top matchups ahead of them. So like, if Caleb Williams looks great against a Washington or an Oregon or whoever they end up playing down the stretch. I think nobody's going to remember this game, really. I think that he'll, you know, if he throws, if he now he you mentioned the matchups down. because I feel like a Heisman, a big Heisman game is going right. to be USC Washington. I just want to pull it's up. Going to be that. huge. It's going to be huge. USC versus Washington. I just want to pull up the exact date because it's November fourth, so that's two weeks from now. It's going to be at USC. Whoever wins this game, I would argue, becomes the Heisman. Fr- well. Michael Penix is already the Heisman front runner right now, I would argue. I mean, he at least has the betting favorites. If you go online, Google them. We're not going to talk about them because, you know, we're not sponsored by anybody. But if you go and look on betting websites, you'll see that Michael Penix Jr. is currently the front runner for the Heisman. If he, if Michael Penix goes into Southern Cal, and has a good game, you know, throws three touchdowns, continues his pace for 40, and beats Caleb Williams, he's going to win the Heisman. Like, at that point, you can almost sign, seal, and deliver it because then he's won the matchup, he's being the other guy. If Williams wins that, especially because it will be a road game too, if Williams wins that game, and all the others too, let me also look at USC's schedule for what's coming up all right so you have utah you pretty much have to be all these teams you gotta be utah get that ranked win you better be cal if you lose to cal forget it number five washington number nine oregon maybe still ranked now ranked but might not be ranked then ucla there's not he cannot afford another loss at this point you know, no, he definitely can't. And I think that's also, I think that's true, right? So like, but I don't think it's also because of, the, I think he's also has like a tighter leash per se because he did win it last year. The voters will also look for any way to give it to somebody new. So yeah, I think anytime you have an excuse to give it to someone else. And I say the same yeah. thing for Michael Penix Jr. too. Because I would say, because he's the leader, it's also just his to lose. If he if anything goes wrong for him, it will become where they are just looking for someone else to give it to. If they look for an excuse to give it to JJ McCarthy, they absolutely will. And I think that I think the the uh, big game for Panics actually outside of the USC game because I think that one's going to be huge. 
I think that one that is still going to be huge for him down the stretch of the season is they got to go on the road to Oregon State. And Oregon State is really good. Like they look really good. And if he if he doesn't show up in that game, I mean, it'll be even if he does beat Caleb Williams, let's just say Washington and USC play. Washington's got a fantastic defense. So I'm not too sure if that game's going to be a shootout, like some people think. But uh, if you're a ranked say, opponent, you can say the same thing with Utah. You like two good like, teams. But it's one of those things though, because at least with Utah, I mean, if you look at Utah's game, they're at least at home. So I feel a little they good are. about that's true. Home, they have to go on the road to Oregon State, and Oregon State again. They've been, they've been, they've only got one loss. So does Utah. But this team, like I think, if you go, you see this, this Washington team go on the road to Oregon State, and let's just say before that, Washington plays USC, and it's close. And let's just say for the sake, I don't think it's going to be high scoring. But let's just say for the sake it is, and they both duel and it's like they each throw four touchdowns similar amount of yards and Caleb Williams the rest of the way even though may lose that game wins every other one of his games and puts up ridiculous numbers and then you see panics go to Oregon State and maybe have like a one touchdown game a couple of picks and they get rolled oh yeah like I said earlier and I agree with that because it's still also Penix's to lose right if he goes out and has a bad game on the road it could be over for him too but also in the same game with the matchup, let's say they both, you know, you say equal stats and all that. Even if one team wins, like let's say USC beats Washington, but Williams only has like one touchdown, no interception, but Penix Jr. And this is, and by the way, you can flip the script on this too. Just replace the name in the order in the sentence, goes and throws five touchdowns. Then they're going to say, oh, well, this guy lost, but he was more of why the team was in it to begin with, especially because stats matter too. Yeah, yeah, they do. And speaking of stats, I was looking at some numbers here from some of the potential candidates. I mean, we got I got to talk about Bo Nix here for a second because you know throughout oh, his college career, unbelievable this year. I mean, the theme with Bo Nix throughout his college career is that he throws picks, and he only has thrown one interception up to this point in the season. Only one that, pick Nix this time. Let's let's talk about flipping the script. Um, so when that you get, that's when you get enough years, when you get enough years in college, you're finally gonna have one where you're just better than everyone because you're what 25 and everyone else is 19. <laughs> like Stetson Bennett for the past couple of years. No, I mean, yeah, I mean, hey, it'll be interesting. And I, I think that obviously we haven't talked as much about him because Oregon lost, but I also on an off topic, a little bit branching off topic here. I don't see how Oregon should have even dropped even a spot for losing that game because of how close it was and how good Washington is and how good well, they are. I maybe it's not necessarily that they dropped. Sometimes you, you don't drop, another team moves up. I'm just going to put AP ball so that I have it in front of me. Yeah, the team that is above them is Texas. Texas. And I still think that – I think – and I know this is like kind of silly because it's like a one-spot thing – I would still put Oregon over Texas. I like Oregon more than Texas. I think the conference they're in is tougher. And I think that they had a really good loss I agree. on the, on, I think that a really good loss against Washington and Texas down the stretch of that game against Oklahoma kind of fell flat. I feel like, but that's a one spot difference. And I was going a little bit off topic there. The point is, I mean, back to the Heisman talk, there's, you know, number of different quarterbacks. I know that the odds say Panics is the favorite, I still think Caleb Williams, because of the road down, like because of those matchups that are upcoming, um, I still think he's the favorite. I don't. I think a lot of people are kind of writing him off now because the, because of the game that they just had. Uh, but again, the Pac-12 this year has been a gauntlet in its farewell season, and I mean, there's plenty of room for both of these guys to have big games and maybe down games down the stretch. Now again. If they start losing a lot, like if they lose to Washington, like you said, and he doesn't look good, or if they lose to UCLA, yeah, then I don't think he's the favorite anymore. But I think as it stands, I don't think the one loss to Notre Dame has taken him. Like, I don't think that's what took him out of the driver's seat. Now, if people want to say Panics' win over Oregon catapulted him over Caleb Williams, I think that's fair. But I don't think, like, Williams took himself out of the driver's seat in that game per se. Yeah, no, totally makes sense. And one guy we really haven't talked about just because you brought up tech, you know, Texas, uh, Oregon. On the flip side, the Texas game where they lost to Oklahoma, Dylan Gabriel. I almost feel like that game, despite the fact that he's kind of putting people on Heisman watch right now, 
I feel like that game almost hurts him too. Cause you go in, you have a big game against a major opponent and you have, yeah, two touchdowns, one passing touchdown, one rushing. He also had a rough game against Cincinnati. who's lost four in a row. You have to start looking at these matchups. Like, is he just beating up on the weaker competition? I think I think I would agree with your point there on Gabriel if I thought he was a real candidate. Like I think that the only reason why we're talking about it here, and again, he's had he has good numbers, he's got decent numbers, but it's because the Oklahoma's perfect up to this point, and they do have yeah. some marquee and wins. Winning is still a factor. Point. And um, but because of like all the other guys we've talked about, you know, the Drake Mays, the Bonex, the Panics, Caleb Williams, um, Jordan Travis, any of these guys. Uh, I think that s- somebody is going to be left off this list, and it wouldn't surprise me if it was him, despite the record that they have. Now, next week is going to be – I fully expect this upcoming week for Dylan Gabriel to be big because, one, UCF is not good this year, and the fact that he left UCF. Yes. I, I think I think he's going to – I think he's going to bring his A game for this game. But – Especially I, because you can't lose to – I don't left. think UCF has even won a Big 12 game yet this year. So that 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 would be pretty nice to at least continue to beat the team you left. It would, it would look really bad for Gabriel if you lose to your one, your former school, two is new to the conference, three isn't winning in conference. I just want to also just going off topic. You remember how like. UCF in back in the day was like, oh yeah, we went undefeated. We could totally have be in Bama, won the playoff. This is why the Kali metric is totally correct in making us number one. Like they just joined the Big 12 and they're getting absolutely smacked. It's Cincinnati's not looking great either. W- w- going off topic, like <laughs> what do you even make of that? All right. I, I know I know what you're doing. I know what you're doing. Um out of respect for the many people that I know that go to UCF and the fact that I'm from Orlando, I am going I'm to put you on the spot on purpose since you're I, from Orlando. Yeah, I am going to go out on a limb here, and I'm actually, I'm actually going to, I'm going to defend UCF here as much as what we've heard from them in the past. Oh, and for context, I'm also from the Tampa Bay area, home of the University of South Florida. So it could be a little, it could be a little salty that the war on I four is now separated. But anyway, but, by the uh, way, I think we can all agree that's bad. Yeah, and for, and for for the record, for the record, obviously, all the talking that their fans have done, you know, for years and all the winning and success, and now they move into the Big Twelve. First of all, great for them for getting get to the Big Twelve. It's a big university. I think it's great for the program. They have great fans as far they they, they show up, and I think obviously. Yes, they joined the conference, and in their first year, they haven't been winning. They haven't won a conference game yet. Again, it's also a kind of a timing thing, too. Like, they're joining this conference, and it happens to be one of also their years that they're not a very good team. Like, we got to look at the players they have this year compared to the players that they've had in the past. Like, they've yeah. had Gabe Davis. They've had, you, you know, they have had players on both sides of the ball that have been also like who have they lost to like like look kansas is getting better right kansas is good this year like we have to stop baylor what was that it seems like baylor where they blew it and baylor good by the way they are two and four right no and i and i and i get that and i get that they've had games there that they probably should have won like i'm not trying to make an excuse for them that they're zero and three uh, because they're zero and three, they maybe should be one and two or whatever. But I do think that yes, they switched into a better conference. I don't think I don't think this means that the reason why they were winning in the past was because of their conference. I do think that obviously their conference is harder. I mean, conference but will always think... play a part. Like go ask Nebraska it how it going from the Big will. Twelve to the Big Ten worked out. Right. No, it will. But we've seen, you know, obviously they, when they had their perfect season, they beat Auburn. Like they're capable of, like, even like their better teams were capable of hanging in there with some of uh, the better teams in other conferences. Like, hey, is Auburn I'm, really we, a we better remember. Is Auburn really that good, though? We got to remember. Like they so played up to Bama, but no matter how bad they are, they always show up for the Iron Bowl. They do. But we also have to remember. The Gasparilla Bowl did happen, and Florida also lost to a UCF. So it's like, yeah, you can still fire the coach. They did. They did. Again, 
But what I'm trying to get my point that I'm trying to get to is with UCF is I think the bottom line here isn't the fact that they changed conferences this year. I think it's the fact that they changed conferences in a year that they also don't have a great team. I think that I some of these teams that. in the past, not saying they would have gone like let's take the perfect team, the perfect record team, for example, or the when they went on to win like 25 straight games where they went from one season to the next and they were on that ridiculous streak. If you took those teams and you put them in the big 12, I still think they're winning a majority of those games. They may have like one, two, maybe three losses in general, as opposed